Well, the screen is filling with wonderful people. And of course, we hope that many of you will um, let us see your, uh, your faces. And um, I'm Deb Habib, I'm gonna be the presenter, but you'll hear more from others first, but we did wanna invite everyone to, if you wish, while we're waiting, to put into the chat something that you would like to grow or learn to grow better. Sorry, I was, uh, yes, I was just, I was muted. Um, again, Deb Habib, and I look forward to uh, sharing more with you tonight. And you'll hear some other intros first, but something you would like to grow or learn to grow better into the chat while we're waiting for this wonderfully large group tonight to um, arrive. Great. Right. If you're if you're coming on, if you're just coming on, we're just waiting. And if you want to put into the chat something you would like to grow or learn to grow better. Some great, great stuff coming up here. Victoria, BC, my goodness. Wow, so if you're just coming on, folks are putting into the chat something you'd like to grow or learn to grow better, and Benet just added that suggestion as well. Oh my goodness, this is gonna take a week to, to uh, respond to some of these, but there's some great, great, wonderful things in there that makes me hungry for some gardens to come. And folks are putting into the chat something you'd like to grow or learn to grow better if you wish. All right, everybody. I think we have a lot of folks that are still joining us or going to be joining us. Um, as people are populating in the chat, we can um, keep doing that as we get started with our program. Just for the essence of time, we really wanna go ahead and get started um, as close to on time as possible. So people will still be joining us, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Nico. I am a graduate student in the environmental education program here at Antioch University in Keene, um, Keene, New Hampshire. I see we have folks from all over the world. So this is great. Um, as part of my time at Antioch, I work for an organization called Community Garden Connections or it's um, you know affectionately called CGC. So we don't have to say that over and over again. Um, CGC has worked in the community here in Keene, New Hampshire, with many organizations like the YMCA and family organizations and community kitchens to help promote food justice in the face of climate change. Um, as part of the National Association for Conservation Districts, the Urban Ag Agriculture Conservation Grant Initiative, um, CGC and Antioch University have partnered with the Cheshire County Conservation District, Keene Public Library, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and the Monadnock Farming Community Coalition to bring this program, Monadnock Grows Together, to everybody here. Um, this program is a free local resource for gardeners and small-scale um, small scale urban agriculture um, farmers. And this provides advice, information, support for folks um, in whatever ways that they might need. 
So as part of this project, local growers in Keene and the surrounding towns here um, can have access to really great gardening resources. Um, there's one-on-one -on -one assistance and office hours at the Keene Public Library from me, the Urban Ag and Gardens Coordinator. Um, if you're in the area, stay tuned because we're working on um, our spring dates. Those are coming up pretty soon. It'll be probably a mid-March or early April start and we'll do like a weekly sort of garden club kind of um, format for that. So stay tuned for details on that. Um, there's gardening workshops, which you all are a part of right now. Um, there's a tool lending library and a seed saving resource and free seeds at the Keene Public Library. And then at the Frost Free Library in Marlboro, New Hampshire, there's also free seeds available there. Um, we also have a spring workshop series that's coming up and there's a few details that are still being worked out, but we have about four or five workshops that will be running from mid-March through early to mid-May. And they kind of cover a real big variety of topics from cover cropping to um, seed starting and things like that. So stay tuned for those things. And you can find us on like CGC's Instagram or our Facebook page or our website. Um, so if you just Google Community Garden Connections Antioch or Cheshire County Conservation District, you'll go right to our webpage and you'll be able to find more information there. Um, so from the Cheshire County Conservation District, today we're joined by Benet Hershon, um, and she will be helping to moderate the workshop and kind of help with all of our technology pieces, um, because surprise, this is my first Zoom workshop that I am helping to um, run. So Benet is here as great support for us all. Um, one more thing before I introduce our facilitator today, who has kind of been chatting with us all anyways, um, it's just a couple of guidelines to help make sure that we have like a really nice smooth workshop. So a couple of things that we're hoping for, um, please try to stay muted um, throughout the workshop until it's time for Q&A. Um, so everybody should be started muted um, and just be aware of that. So to check to make sure you can kind of go to the bottom left corner of your screen and there's a little microphone icon. If you're muted, there'll be a little red slash through it and that'll tell you that you're muted. Same thing with the video icon that's just to the right of that. So if there's a red slash through it, that means there's no video and we would love to see your faces if you're comfortable. I don't know, Deb might be doing a little bit of interaction with us as a workshop too. So it might be nice to have yourselves um, on video if you are comfortable with that. And lastly, we have um, lots of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So um, if you have questions, feel free to like jot them down on a piece of paper and keep them with you. Um, or if you'd like to, you can send your questions directly to Benet during the workshop if you think you'll forget them or you don't have access to pen or paper. Um, so to send a message directly to Benet, what you'll do is go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll either see an icon that says chat or there's three little dots and it says more. And you'll click on that and find the chat. And then when you click on the chat, there'll be everybody's messages that are popping up. And then there's a little blue icon in the bottom where you would be populating what you might wanna say. And it says everyone. If you click on the blue icon that says everyone, you'll notice that there is everybody is listed in there. So you can send a message to anybody that's in the chat. So what you'll do, Benet is one of the first people that's listed there. So you can click on Benet's name and send a message directly to Benet. So if you wanna send your questions in that way, that works as well. Um, and after the workshop, we'll kind of work through all of those. And um, if there's anything else that pops up, we can go through that in a little bit. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that was everything for guidelines. Um, so it's time to introduce Deb. So thanks everybody for your patience. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Deb Habib of Seeds of Solidarity as our workshop presenter this evening. Um, Deb is a farmer, educator, and cook who loves sharing her three decades of experience to help grow healthy, vibrant communities. She is the executive director of Seeds of Solidarity Education Center in Orange, Massachusetts and the co-founder of the North Quabbin Garlic and Arts Festival. She is the author with her husband, Ricky Baruch, of the book, Making Love While Farming, Field Guide to a Life of Passion and Purpose. Deb holds a doctorate of education from the University of Massachusetts and a master's of science in environmental studies from Antioch University of New England. 
Thank you. And it's all yours, Deb. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank all of you for being here tonight. And we have um, uh, lots of names, not as many faces. Those in New England might, you know, still be in your pajamas from our snow day today. I'm not sure, but either way is fine. And I really want to thank um, Monadnock Grows Together and the Cheshire County Conservation District for this wonderful series that they've uh, been hosting. And it's really fun to have seen in the chat uh, people from, wow, like, you know, right nearby in British Columbia. And I think I saw the Netherlands, my goodness. And uh, if you're just joining on, we had suggested while we were waiting that folks wanted to, if, if folks wanted to kind of list something that they um, would like to grow or learn to grow better. And there were lots of things listed there. Um, we're going to do some more general stuff tonight, but of course there will be time for Q&A after some slides that I'll show. But I did notice that two of the um, comments in the chat when I asked something you'd like to grow or learn to grow better, one person had everything and one person had anything. And I thought that was really fun, fun to see, which um, leads me to just a couple of comments before I share some slides and conversation with you or, or presentation rather with you. Um, you know, we always like to say to people and, and, and as, as Nika so wonderfully offered in, in her introduction, again, I'm, I'm both a farmer and an educator. I've been farming for a long time and also I'm a gardener. Those can be two different things. Um, but whenever we're teaching any workshops or classes, uh, preferably live at Seeds of Solidarity or in other settings, we like to say, and I say we because my um, husband Ricky Baruch and I often teach together. Um, so I, we like to say, you know, there's as many ways to garden as there are gardeners. And with the uh, sort of, I guess, uh, the whole, you know, inter internet and all the web and all the information that's out there, as many of you are well aware, there can be some really helpful things and there can just be too much sometimes, which can be overwhelming and make us feel like, well, there must be one way to do this or one way to do this right. And you keep looking and looking and looking for the right way, in this case, um, growing food or gardening. And then there's so many different bits of piece and pieces out there, one might just say, it's too much, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just not doing this. And so I hope that um, we can let go of that because really the main thing is that it's, it's just people have been growing food ever since there's been people and <laughs> on this planet and there's so many ways to do it. And, you know, really just let, let it be a joy, let it be a creative process, even after gardening for 35 and 40 years, I learn something new every day and every year. So it really, it really should be a joy. So keep that in mind. There's as many ways to garden as there are gardeners. That said, there's definitely some key things to keep in mind um, for more successful gardens because different plants require different things and have some different needs. Um, the other thing that that um, you know I like to just suggest is somebody said they want to grow everything, which is super fun, enthusiastic. But you can also just grow what you love or what you enjoy eating. Um, some of you here, I'm sure, are beginner gardeners. Others are more advanced gardeners. And so it can be a progression. You know, if you like to use a few fresh herbs on your food, then just grow a few fresh herbs. You know, if you don't like tomatoes, you don't have to grow tomatoes. If you love tomatoes, you can just grow 12 different types of tomatoes. And you're still a gardener, right? Whether you... Um, grow lots of things or a few things. Again, it really is that process. So I think on that note, um, you know, perhaps you're getting the feeling that my intention in this short workshop tonight will just be to offer some ideas, um, you know, enthusiasm, support. Uh, and what I'm gonna do shortly is turn on a slideshow. And I'll be speaking as we go along. And as Nico mentioned in her wonderful introduction, during the slideshow, best is if you can use the chat to direct any questions directly to Benet. And Nico explained how to do that. That would be super. And then, you know, after the slides are done, uh, Benet will have sort of summarized and distilled some of those. And we'll start with any questions there and or some of the things we saw in the initial chat and then just open up open up the floor 
to more questions. Uh, and then I'll also just have a short, fun demo of something that I'll hold up in front of the screen. So I think on that note, again, thank you all for being here. If you've just come in, this is a fantastic group of participants. Um, this is being recorded. So people I believe will have access afterwards. And I am now just gonna take a minute here to get my slides up. Oh, sorry, to screen share. Sorry, it's just taking me a second here. Apologies. Huh. Oh no, hold on. I'm very sorry, I have to back up a minute here. Of course, this was tested and it's being odd. Let me stop the share for a second. All right. There we go, that should work. Okay, are we good? Great, thank you very much for your patience with that. So um, again, this presentation is called uh, Grow Food Everywhere, Great Gardens for All Settings. And Grow Food Everywhere is a tagline for our organization. And um, just on the left here, on what, whatever side you're seeing it on, those are some gardens that Seeds of Solidarity put in at a former factory. On the right, our greenhouse. And I'm gonna talk less about Seeds of Solidarity and just more, again, about sharing some of the ideas that we as gardeners and farmers have um, explored and taught and practiced in many urban, rural, and suburban settings. So um, a very important thing to keep in mind is um, your seeds and your plants and where you get those. And um, the seeds are really an important piece. So really the, the heart of a lot of successful gardens are, are healthy seeds, healthy seedlings. And when I say seedlings, that is um, the same as basically if I was saying transplants or starts. So the word seedlings, starts, and transplants are often used um, simultaneously or all at the same time to, meet, sm to mean small baby plants that you get, that you grow yourself, that you get from a farmer's market, that you get from um, you know, a farmer or a local garden store. But there's lots of, lots of wonderful small seed companies and I do recommend starting with, with, with those and supporting those. And here you see just a couple. One is called True Love Seeds, which is in Philadelphia. It's a BIPOC run seed company. Hudson Valley Seeds um, is a wonderful source in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I can go on and on. There's, hot, there's, there's many fabulous seed companies that now exist. And one thing I encourage people to look for is whether they've taken what's called a pure seed pledge. So basically, are they using genetically modified seeds or not? And I would encourage you to consider um, smaller seed companies that are not using genetically modified seeds. And again, there's many, many of them. We can offer more in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, another thing just to know and keep in mind is that you can save, save seeds. Um, I'm sure many of you do that. That might be considered something that you, you know, want to do once you've gotten a little more experience with gardening. But in order to save seeds, just keep in mind, and again, don't get overwhelmed here, that you'd often start with seeds that are known as open pollinated or heirloom. And those are seeds that will uh, enable their offspring to be basically true to form. So rather than a hybrid, open pollinated, or heirloom means you can save the seeds and pass them on, and that's a fabulous thing to do. I'm gonna talk a lot more about soil, um, and so I'm not gonna focus on that too much. I just kind of wanted to bring forward these concepts that starting with you know, really healthy, vibrant, vital seeds and healthy, vibrant seedlings, whether you grow them yourself 
or get them again from a local farmer's market or farmer who may sell directly or supply a nursery, that's great. Not only because you're supporting local, but anytime a seedling is like transported from, you know, where it's originally grown to a big box store, that cheap price might be appealing, but it comes at a cost because those seedlings have been, you know, sprayed and sprayed and sprayed with things to kind of just keep them looking slightly green and alive. And they, they're just, they don't have the same life force as a local seedling that you've grown yourself or gotten, you know, from a, from a farmer or local garden center. Plus you're supporting a big box store instead of a local farmer or garden center. Okay. Okay. So um, just some images of all the different types of um, containers that people might use for different settings. And you don't, have to grow food in containers. I'm gonna show some pictures of raised beds and, and other ways right in the earth and some techniques for doing that and building soil. But you know, some of you might have a small space. So you know, that center one and those root pouch gardening bags are um, on my mom's apartment balcony. And she was a gardener and then you know, her age prohibited that, but growing in different bags or even your old canvas grocery bags, um, crates, uh, Tupperware trays that have gotten a bit of a you know, crack in them that you, know, you can use. The main thing to keep in mind is drainage, um, repurposing, and also that you wanna fill them with rich, healthy soil before you put in your seeds and seedlings. So there's lots of options there to be creative with containers. And you see that picture, um, that's the entry to our house and even though we have all this land and all this, you know, these farm fields at Seeds of Solidarity, I love, you know, using pots and other containers to just kind of not only show how that can be done, but just have a little fun with it. So here's just some more ideas of containers. And again, you don't have to do it this way, but some of the benefits of using containers. Um, and when I say containers, I also mean wooden raised beds as well as bags and pots and things like that is that if you're not sure about what the soil is below where you're you know, creating a garden or there is no soil to speak of on an asphalt area or you know, a rocky area, it's a wonderful way to create basically um, a vessel into which you can put some, some known you know, rich soil and, um, and compost. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So you can see again, just lots of creative things here. Also in some settings like this, um, one of the images here is a community health center where Seeds of Solidarity once put in gardens and also a family child care center. You know, by having that kind of boundary, especially in public spaces, it's a, a little bit e easier for people to move around the gardens and enjoy them and harvest from them rather than on the gardens. So again, just a few more ideas of different types of um, containers and <clears throat> basically the rule of thumb, be it a, a, a container like a bag or a large pot, you can often get um, recycled nursery pots that maybe had a tree in them or something from garden centers or landscape centers. But the rule of thumb is basically uh, a, approximately 50% loam, which is topsoil, and 50% of some you know, type of compost. And depending on where you are, if you're in a rural area, you might be able to get uh, from a local farm compost. And when I say compost for the beginning gardeners here, I should really be saying finished compost because um, you know, some of you may have a container under your sink or on your counter where you put you know, eggshells and banana peels and things like that, coffee grinds, tea bags, so that's the stuff that will then be added to um, a pile or brought to a facility with other materials to make finished compost. But when I say finished compost, it means it looks like rich, dark soil. Um, and again, more and more, uh, there's places where you can either bring your compost or have compostables, I should say, picked up. So uh, to, to then be transformed to finished soil, which can then be sold back to gardeners or given to gardeners or however it works. 
But again, you can get, if you don't have a local source, like a local farm or a composting facility to get the stuff to fill your garden beds or garden bags, you can certainly get you know, a quality organic bagged mix from a garden center. Um, but what I always recommend if you're doing that to somehow get some life into it, again, be it in your garden bags or beds or the, the ground. And when I say life, I mean worms and microbes that are naturally occurring in the soil and are really important to healthy gardens. So even if you add just like a little bit of a starter of some, of some rich um, life filled stuff rather than stuff you might get in a bag, um, that'll be a great, a great thing because then those, the, that, those life forms will be able to reproduce in your garden and, and, and help out in many ways that I can talk more about. Here's just some more examples of um, vertical gardens. And I just like, it's really fun. You know, if you don't have much space, these are like old, those old um, shoe trees, not shoe trees, but whatever you call those things that, you know, you put your shoes in, 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 um, in a uh, closet, a pallet repurposed and so forth. You know, so the upside is you can use vertical space if you don't have much space or you wanna add that to your kind of gardening scene and landscape. You know, the downside is it's less soil, which means it's, things are gonna dry out more quickly and you can mostly only grow smaller things in there. So you wouldn't stick a large tomato plant, for example, in one of those vertical shoe things, right? Because it just wouldn't have enough soil to get big, but you could do, you know, a variety of fresh herbs like parsley and basil and, and cilantro and things like that and small flowers. So just another fun thing to think about to, um, enhanced space. And there's all kinds of vertical gardening ideas out there that you can, again, I said, don't get overwhelmed by the internet, but that said, there's lots of um, ideas there as well as books with lots of different um, container garden and vertical gardening ideas. And again, just, you know, if you're getting this feeling, just reuse, upcycle, be playful. The, um, the barrels that you see in that top image uh, are, were cut in half 50 gallon um, food grade drums. So when I say food grade, things that didn't have toxic stuff in them, but you know, oils and vinegars and things like that. And sometimes you can ask around if there's a place near you that say makes pickles or whatever, uh, you, you know, they might have big food grade drums like this. Or So, you know, when we first started our farm, Seeds of Solidarity, and I'm gonna show more about this in a minute, there was no soil to go down into. We had to build the soil from the ground up. And again, I'm getting to some of those, um, how to build the soil from the ground up ideas. So we cut a lot of these barrels, again, made sure the, the um, solid ends had holes for drainage. We drilled those <laughs> and we were growing salad greens for sale to restaurants in 50 gallon barrels like this. So you can see the overflowing um, abundance there. You'll see, um, uh, this is one of my fun things and I'm gonna demo it if we have time, a um, colander salad garden, uh, which, which is a great thing for the windowsill. And I think somebody in the initial chat talked about growing things on their windowsill, be it seedlings or, or other things. And the reason I put that um, other image just with a cedar shingle, which makes a great plant marker in your garden beds painted. This was a project I did at a, um, a recovery center actually. And somebody had some artistic skills and they wanted to kind of nicely decorate with paint markers, some beautiful signs. So, you know, if that kind of thing inspires you, be playful with your garden and, you know, bring in the qualities that you enjoy and the things that you have to share that make you happy. Just a few more um, images of vertical, again, repurposing things for smaller stuff is good, not for larger stuff. I know a lot of folks are interested in how to attract pollinators to your garden. And when we say pollinators, we don't just mean um, bees or honeybees, we mean native bees and we mean moths and dragonflies and, um, you know, all kinds of things, the list goes on, uh, uh, hummingbirds and so forth. So there's many, many pollinators out there. So I, I think there's, there's definitely plants that are, that are particularly attractive to pollinators, be it because of their color and so forth, or night blooming, like the um, Nicotiana, that white plant in that image there. 
But a great rule of thumb um, is to mix veggies, herbs, and flowers. And not only does that diversity help um, kind of balance out what plants need what nutrients, right? Um, not only does it help you end up with a nice bouquet on your table, as well as some fresh herbs and vegetables, but having a diversity of things that bloom at different times, um, that are different colors, different heights, different scents, definitely is attractive to pollinators. So I want to move a little bit into um, talking about um, some no-till methods and how to build healthy soil. And again, if you're joining uh, the, the, um, the presentation, if you've recently joined, know that in about 10 more minutes or so, we're going to break out into some, not break out, but there will be time for your questions in the chat or live. Um, and you can also send those to directly to Benet um, in the chat at this time. But I um, want to talk a little bit about something that's just as farmers, as well as gardeners, become critical to um, to us at Seeds of Solidarity in Orange Mass, and something that we teach a lot to new and um, advanced gardeners as well as farmers, um, are methods that are known as no-till, which is as they sound. Um, there's this idea that you have to churn up and till the soil. And actually, um, more and more, it's becoming clear that by not doing that, you have the opportunity not only to build a healthier soil ecosystem, but um, by not tilling, you're storing carbon in the soil where it belongs, rather than um, releasing that carbon into the atmosphere by tilling, especially with machinery. By not tilling your soil, you're usually mulching your soil, which then resembles more, say, what happens in the forest, you know, where you have layers of different types of soil covered with whatever's falling from the forest. But that kind of ecosystem is a model for how we might want to think about our gardens, keeping the soil covered. The soil wants to be covered. It doesn't want to be exposed and bare, which can lead to drying out and erosion um, and or erosion. Um, the life in the soil wants to be covered. And you're conserving moisture by keeping your soil covered. And a fact that everybody can get behind, you are reducing, if not eliminating, weeding, right? So what can often happen in a garden is it starts out great. I'm sure many of you are nodding your heads on screen or internally right now. Um, you know, it can start out great. You've gotten your rototiller out, which again, you don't need, but just tell them the kind of usual sequence sometimes. You've gotten your rototiller out, you've churned everything up, it's looking good, you plant your seeds, um, and then, and then you, you're watering them, and then there's weeds, and there's more weeds, and there's more weeds, and what do you do, right? So these methods um, uh, of, of um, not tilling, and I'm just gonna show you a before and after here, are really beneficial in so many ways. This is an image of uh, about 25 years ago, when my husband Ricky and I uh, came to the land that we now farm, which is called Seeds of Solidarity. And it was not your typical farmland. We couldn't afford your quote unquote typical farmland. Um, and a lot of typical farmland is nice and flat and has good drainage. And unfortunately it can be used for development. So we also have to figure out how to grow food, not only as gardeners, but farmers in you know, settings that are less than desirable, be that in rural, urban, or suburban settings, what people might call marginal land. So this was definitely pretty marginal land. It was forested, but there was not rich, fertile agricultural soil. So here's what it looked like about 25 years ago, and this is the same spot now. And we didn't have an option of really going down into the soil. I mean, the driveway is pretty much what it was like. So we really, even though we'd been farming prior and my husband had a um, organic 20 acre um, farm in New York state on which he did use tractors and he did not find it humanly sustainable and he doesn't like fixing tractors. So, you know, he really sought to find another way but because we couldn't really go down into the soil we really needed to work from the ground up. And people laughed at first as often happens when you do things that are a little you know, different than the quote unquote norm. 
but now more and more, both for reasons of climate resilience and, and needing, and all of us needing to grow food in all of our communities, um, building from the ground up and not tilling is, um, you see a lot more workshops and talk about it and books about it than you did 25 years ago. And we've been happy to contribute to a lot of those. So again, as mentioned, you know, there's many reasons not to till the soil. Um, a largely, you're built to, to really support the building of a healthy soil ecosystem and letting work nature work its magic. Um, also, that you can um, really use quite simple tools. So you don't need, you know, a, uh, um, a rototiller and all those kinds of things and tractors and things you might think you need, which can also be not only cost prohibitive, but intimidating. So these are some of our favorite tools. And again, even on a commercial farm, which we have, you know, with five commercial scale, 100 foot greenhouses and a couple of acres in production, these are the tools that are most often used. Um, the wooden handled ones are called dibblers and uh, different kinds of dibblers. They're often used for planting bulbs or they have been, somebody was on from the Netherlands. So they would know about that perhaps there. Um, but we use them to go through cardboard and I'm gonna show you that in a moment. And a soil knife is a really simple tool. That's a favorite. Um, a few buckets, different kinds of, um, of, of mulch and some compost and you can really be good to go. So um, here you have uh, a method of, um, and I'm just looking at my screen. I hope you're not seeing all the stuff on the top that gets in the way. And I hope I'm the only one seeing that, but okay, good. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, here's a really cool method of um, what, you know, what we call the Insta garden using cardboard. And people will, will certainly ask in this presentation because you always do. So I'll try and give you a, a little head start on that. As long as you use plain corrugated cardboard, brown plain corrugated cardboard with minimal ink, you're, it's safe. We've done a lot of tests on it. A lot of people have not waxed cardboard, um, not heavily inked cardboard, but plain corrugated cardboard. The layers are actually, um, it uses a hide glue. I'm sorry, but from, you know, um, usually the animal industry with that's rich in protein and, and very much uh, desirable to worms in the soil, the life in the soil. But plain corrugated cardboard is a great mulch and it's a great way to start or enhance a garden. So here's what we you would call the Insta garden. Um, so you know it's spring is coming. there's an area of lawn or weeds or whatever you want to turn into a garden. you lay down some um, some of these corrugated cardboard boxes, plain brown cardboard, you decide where you want to plant some seedlings. So this is better for seedlings than seeds. And again, those who came on uh, late, I talked a little bit about that, but a seedling is also known as a transplant or a start. You figure out the spacing, which is an important thing in gardening. That's one of the rules of thumb. You don't want to plant you know, um, a squash two inches apart. You want to give it the space that's recommended on the seed packet or a seed catalog, which is a really good source of information. You dig the hole where you're gonna put that plant and fill it with soil, put the plant, uh, fill it with like a nice rich soil or compost that you might bring in, put the plant in that hole and then cover it with some kind of mulch, which could be straw, mulch hay, unsprayed glass, grass clippings, um, slightly rotted leaves. If you live near the, the sea, it might be seaweed. Some um, we've taken sometimes to using some some um, manures that are mostly decomposed but not completely. You can put those on top but not in the soil, and then um, you can also use wood chips as long as it stays on top of the cardboard. You don't want fresh wood chips to uh, mix in with the soil because they'll it'll rob the nitrogen in the soil, uh, and you don't want that to happen. Just it'll rob the nitrogen because they're trying to break down. They're just doing their thing. And then you cover the whole thing with mulch and then you've got this nicely mulched, minimal watering, weed-free garden. And by the next year, um, that cardboard will be pretty broken down and you can just do it again. So there's a few other ways to use cardboard. 
I know there might be a bunch of questions about this at the end, so I just want to cover just a couple more ways. Um, there's all, it's also sometimes called the lasagna method when you layer different organic materials and then kind of plant into those. So especially building from the ground up, if you happen to have a, you know, some nice piles of, of wood chips or rotted leaves and some compost, you can layer things and then finish with a top um, of cardboard and a more mulch on top and do kind of the same thing that I showed you before there. Again, in a larger area, you can lay cardboard down, lay it down any time of year. Um, Ricky takes the tape. Ricky does not take the tape off because he lays out so much. Um, and then it's kind of fun a year later to be maybe going back over that field and all that's left are pieces of tape and you pick them up and put them in the trash then. You can really see that the cardboard is decomposed. I do strip off the tape, especially in garden settings. Uh, but this is another way to cover a large area and you can do it in the fall or winter, you know, or early spring. So we have some snow here in New England now, but you know, um, you can put cardboard on top of snow, especially if there's not too much. And again, part of the reason for this is, or a big reason for this is to create a sort of mulch, but you're also feeding the life in the soil. You're feeding the life in the soil. The worms love to eat through the cardboard and leave what's called worm castings in their place, which is a terrifically rich um, natural source of fertilizer. Worms, uh, they, they poop out, what they poop out is five to 10 times richer in macronutrients and micronutrients than what they take in. So they're really incredible alchemists. And you can see this picture of um, lettuce and chard and so forth in our beds that was planted by dibbling or making holes through the, card, the, um, the moistened cardboard. And again, you always wanna cover your cardboard with something like a mulch um, and there's no weeds. So that's huge. Um, so again, here's a diversity of crops planted into cardboard. You saw this picture once before, uh, no weeds, moisture maintained, all good. Cardboard, cardboard feeding the life in the soil. I'm almost through with the slides, um, so we'll be able to break into questions, but I do want to mention just a couple of other things, particularly for the more experienced gardeners. And that is um, other ways of doing no-till and other ways of feeding the soil. And again, this is for everyone. So, and this, this is the use of cover crops and cover crops assumes that you're gonna have, you know, a little bit of, of um, extra space. Uh, you're not, this is not for container gardening. Although you can do a few cover crops in container gardening. Sorry if you're hearing sounds behind me, by the way, the uh, plow person chose now to, um, to show up, which we're grateful for, but that's, that's the, back, the background there. Um, so cover crops are also, you know, great ways to re-nourish the soil. There's a number of different kinds of cover crops. They're also known as green manures. Um, buckwheat is something you can put in the summer, uh, rye and vetch over the winter. They keep the ground covered. When they come to blossom, they attract pollinators. And one of the things that happens in no-till farming is Rather than churning them back in or tilling them back in, you can basically cover them with cardboard or on larger scale, farmers use something called a silage tarp to then return those green manures to the soil to enrich them. But I wanted to mention this because, you know, the, the, the many ways that we can basically create um, self-sustaining gardens and create fertility and garden fertility in place uh, is increasingly important as we try and localize our resources and really build soil, build healthy, healthy soil in all communities. Yes, for the purposes of growing food. Yes, for the purposes of capturing and storing carbon as these cover crops also do, you know, pulling carbon uh, from the atmosphere back into the earth, really of critical importance to mitigating the impact of um, climate change. So I just, the final things um, are really, you know, I probably overwhelmed you, which was not my intention, but I probably have. Um, but really, if there's, if there's a piece or two that you can take from this slideshow, wonderful. You know, you don't have to do it all. 
And we will be able to talk more about some specific crops as well as techniques in just a few moments, but mostly just really watch and wonder and enjoy. So it was interesting. These are um, these swallowtail uh, uh, caterpillars were eating my parsley. And, you know, I might have said I have to get rid of them because they're eating my parsley. But, you know, how could you get rid of such a beautiful pair of swallowtail caterpillars that are beneficial in so many ways and creating this lovely heart shape? It was just so amazing to see that. You know, so if I sacrifice a little bit of my parsley, that's okay um, for, for the benefits of the ecosystem. This other plant is a mullein plant. And it was, I took this picture during year one of COVID um, 2020 in the garden and it had just popped up and I was like, wow, that is like the biggest mullein plant I have ever seen. And I have a mullein in other places, but the seeds scattered and, you know, on their own and, and replanted themselves. And then I realized, you know, mullein is a fantastic um, herb for lung health. So I don't think it was any coincidence really that this amazing mullein plant kind of showed up right in my kitchen garden, reminding me about its uh, use for, for lung, lung health. So there's certainly a lot of um, plant spirit medicine that can be paid attention to more and more. Again, not new ideas at all, quite traditional and ancient ideas that I think we need to keep learning from. And I also wanted to mention again, you know, the importance of um, increasing food access and how, you know, through gardens in all settings, we can really contribute to that. Um, I'm sure some of you on this show are involved in some way in supporting your communities through growing food and sharing food and teaching others to grow food. Uh, the, the image of uh, food spread out around the, the sun on the bag in a mandala is one of our Seeds of Solidarity programs where we um, uh, gather food and, and purchase food from local farmers through a grant funded program that we do through our own nonprofit organization uh, to help redistribute to people um, facing food insecurity in our region, um, the North Quabbin region of Massachusetts, there's a lot of people that really need more fresh food for both health and nourishment reasons. The other two photos are courses we teach at our county jail um, in Greenfield, where we work with people who are incarcerated to um, create gardens at the jail, um, which ranges from even building those garden beds or small cedar containers that they decorate, and again, learning those skills to be able to support their own food resilience and nourishment, both while incarcerated and beyond incarceration. Um, and there's lots of other skills and things that we teach at Seeds of Solidarity through our programs. I um, you know, mostly want to attend to your specific gardening questions, but I hope that you will visit our website, seedsofsolidarity.org, and maybe join our mailing list. Uh, our book was mentioned at, in the wonderful introduction by Nico. We do a lot of different kinds of workshops, including like a full day workshop in the fall on um, no-till methods for um, gardeners and farmers and many other programs. So um, at this time, I am going to get ready to stop the screen share. And again, I apologize that getting onto the slides took me an extra couple of minutes, but I'm glad it worked. And we are back in full group. And I think, um, Nico, you were going to explain again how we were going to um, proceed with some of the, the dialogue that we will take until about 7.15. And then I'll do one more thing before we close. So take it, Nico. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. So what we're going to do now is we have our question and answer time. So um, feel free to send your questions directly to Benet or if you haven't been sending, um, if you have them like on your own sheet of paper. What we're going to do first is work through the ones that Benet has um, in particular. And then after that, um, what we'll do is once we kind of, you know, synthesize those and ask those questions of Deb, we can, um, if people have their own to share, what we'd ask is just that you use the reactions down at the bottom of the screen. So again, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little smiley face with like a plus sign. So if you click on that, there should be a bar at the bottom of that screen that pops up that says raise hand. And as soon as you click that, there'll be a hand that pops up in your screen and you'll move into the front of the chat. So we'll get to see you because there's two pages of screen. So it's hard to keep track of everybody. So if you use that raise hand function, 
we'll be able to see you pop into our screens and we'll be able to call on people kind of in the order that you raise your hand. Um, and also we can be looking if people, if that's a little bit tricky or you can't find it on your screen for some reason, what we can do is we can also just um, try to be cycling through to see if there's anybody that's raising their hand and also feel free to pop it into the general chat that way. So we can try to get to everybody's questions as best we can. So first we'll go to Benet with those questions and then we'll work through folks' questions if you have them personally. Great, well, thank you, Nico, for just that overview. Um, so we have one question in the chat um, from Chris, um, who asked, in New Hampshire with the rocky soil, do you recommend raised beds or what are the best ways to improve specifically rocky soils? Great, thanks, Chris. That's a that's a you know a perfect um, kind of lasagna method uh, uh, response. So, I, and I and I'm glad you asked about raised beds because I want to kind of clarify that when when you hear the term raised beds, it might mean like something that's bounded by wood or rocks or something like that, or it might mean the soil is is um, built up and and turned into what would be known as a permanent raised bed that isn't bounded by anything, but instead of rows, it's it's wide beds in your garden or field. Um, and I, before I get specifically to the building up, I do wanna mention if you do at any point use wood um, to make garden beds, um, don't use pressure treated wood. Just just either get um, you know a local source of, of any wood you can or, or upcycled wood. Um, Cedar is really good because it's rot resistant. It's also a little bit more expensive. Black locust is amazing. Um, it's heavy as anything, but it's like literally like a rock. It'll last forever. Um, but other wood is fine too, as long as it isn't pressure treated. Um, but back to Chris's question, if it's if it's really rocky soil, again, that's, that's a perfect um, way to think about building from the ground up. And what you could do is, is kind of use whatever you have with organic material. So, you know, you might put down like a layer of um, well-rotted leaves and some mulch hay um, and do that again, You're like well-rotted leaves, mulch hay, or even start with a base of wood chips maybe over the rocky soil. And then somehow somewhere get yourself in New Hampshire, you should be able to find some, you know, some, some well-rotted manure or local compost and then put like maybe you know, um, six or so inches of that on your bed or as much as you can get really. And then meanwhile, all those layers below over time will break down. But I would say rocky soil, like really rocky soil um, or even semi-rocky soil is, is a great way to um, build from the ground up. You can put a layer of cardboard down first as well and then build up from there. So great question. Awesome. Okay, did you have any more? Yep, I, just I, I want to get to some of the specific crops that people put in the chat, but maybe there's, you know, we can focus on a few more of these general questions. So, yeah. so Renee, I have two more first. Yeah, I have two more from the chat. Um, Venny asked, how do you prevent woodchucks from raiding your garden? Mm, get a good dog. Um, that is a tricky one. And um, yeah, it, you know, I don't like the word pest control because it's really hard to control pests. And also, um, you know, we have to think more in terms of, of sort of um, relationships, I think, when we talk about pest, pest uh, management. Woodchucks, if you have them, our, our biggest problem actually are porcupines. And last year it was the squirrels, really hard. So there's a lot of um, deterrence, one being a fence um, or fencing. You have to dig down for woodchucks. Others are things that you can get at, you know, a garden supply store, like they actually you can get urines of like coyotes and fox and things like that and put them in um, small bags with holes in them around your garden. Some people find that helpful. Um, there's also a, a, a product that's known as a um, floating row cover. And you can, again, find this in garden centers or in, in some um, Johnny Selected Seeds has a lot of really good supplies in their catalogs, uh, but it's called an agricultural floating row cover. And especially when things are young and tender, you can lay this cover over your gardens or beds and light and moisture still gets in, but it prevents some um, animal and pest damage. So that's also something to look into. 
Awesome. And just another question from the chat. Um, can sawdust be used for mulching? Um, you can use sawdust, again, as long as it's not from fresher treated wood, be really cautious about that and the wood that it came from. So if you know if it's your own sawdust and you know what it came from, but the thing is you don't want to, you don't want any kind of sawdust or wood chips to go directly on or in the soil. So as long as it's on top of cardboard, you're fine um, as a way to keep the cardboard covered. It's also, I would say, sawdust would be a really good use for um, more perennial crops like perennial flowers or fruit trees, again, with cardboard around those, um, those perennial crops or fruit trees, because then it'll just be there and you won't have to worry about moving the sawdust or wood chips away before planting. So that's a really good use of putting around, oh, still over cardboard or over like burlap coffee bags, which we use a lot around perennials. And again, perennials are things that come back year after year um, to both keep weeds down and moisture in. We'll use either cardboard or burlap, uh, organic uh, coffee from organic coffee places, burlap bags, you know, covered with some sort of, of mulch. And again, that keeps weeds down and moisture in. So that would be a good place to use your sawdust. Great. Great. And it and looks again, like yeah. we have a new um, question in the chat from Debbie. And Debbie, I see your hand is also raised. So feel free to unmute if you want to add to your question. Um, but Debbie wrote, um, can an old bureau drawer be used as a container in the garden? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I, I, you know, I think have fun with it. Again, the, the thing that you want to make sure of is drainage. So if you're going to use an old wooden drawer or several of them, that's a really fun idea. Um, but but you'll need to kind of um, drill a few holes in the bottom to make sure that it it drains. Although you know a wood is going to kind of allow some moisture out better than others, the wood is also going to decompose over time. Um, but I you know one thing that comes to mind in thinking about the wood trucks too is um, you know height. So thinking about drawers up on, on um, you know, at different heights or ways that you can and can have some things growing that are a little, a little higher up, you know, up on tables or, or what have you, um, or stands that you make will also keep some of the critters like rabbits and woodchucks that are mostly along the ground from, from uh, getting to those things a little higher up. So sure, yeah, just whatever containers you use, make sure they, you know, didn't have anything toxic in them and that, um, they will allow some drainage or, um, you know, or you can drill some holes in them for drainage. Great. Um, and I can also at any time attend to some of these questions, these great questions about specific crops in the chat. So does any, I don't know if anyone else has their hand up at this time or, or I can attend to some of those great questions. Okay, I'm going to do that. But again, feel free to keep, you know, putting your hand up or entering things in the chat as I talk a little bit more about these. So there's so many great things that people talked about wanting to grow. And one of the things I did not talk about too much in um, the slides were a, a very key thing, which is spacing. So, you know, and I have been guilty of this more than once where you get this beautiful little, you know, tomato seedling, um, that you've grown or gotten from a friend or gotten from a garden center or squash seedling or what have you. And it's like, they say putting it two and a half to three feet apart, that doesn't seem necessary. And, you know, and you plant them too close and then those plants don't thrive in the way that they might because they don't have the airflow, they don't have the room for the roots, the, um, the fruits on them you know, aren't as available to pollinators or the flowers rather aren't as available to pollinators. The fruits don't have the room to develop. So you really do need to pay attention to spacing. And what I will say about spacing is the way that you get that information is either on a seed packet, a seed catalog, or on a tag that might come with your seedling. There's also really great, really great information that several seed companies have about when to start things and how to space things, how far to space things. Um, I mentioned Hudson Valley seeds. I mentioned Johnny's selected seeds. Those are two fantastic sources of information where they, you know, more than seeds. Like for example, Johnny's has a seed 
calculator where you put in your zip code and it tells you when to when to start things for your climate. Really, really helpful. Might not be as helpful to people, you know, in the Netherlands who don't have the zip codes that we use in the US who are on this call, but that's a really helpful thing. Um, but what I will say about spacing is, is that when you have really, when you've built up your soil and have rich soil, and especially when you're using raised beds, you can often have things a little closer than you would if they were in rows. So, you know, a more traditional thing that you might see on a seed packet is like um, plant your lettuce or plant your spinach in rows, you know, seeds six inches apart in rows, eight inches apart or whatever. But we do our spinach completely differently. Like we do our spinach with a method called broadcasting where we um, scatter sow or broadcast seeds in a patch and then cut that spinach as what's called cut and come again and then water it and it comes back again, right? So there's all these different kinds of techniques. So I say that to say um, there's, not, there's not usually one way um, to do things, but spacing is something, especially with larger plants, you do want to pay attention to it. Um, and that said, you can often um, kind of um, use not only your horizontal space, but vertical space as well. So for example, some of you might have heard of a method that's sometimes known as three sisters, which is um, tr some traditional ways of planting among some indigenous peoples where you would have a like winter squash be the ground covering the ground, right? So you've planted your butternut or other winter squash, I think, or, or melon, somebody talked about those, but then you might have pole beans in the midst of that, right? Using more vertical space. And traditionally you would time the planting of those pole beans to climb up corn stalks, right? So you have to time it well. So the corn gets a start and the squash has a start before you plant the pole beans. But I say that to say, you know, kind of utilize vertical space and, you know, um, interspersed flowers and herbs and things like that. You know, you don't have to have, depending on your personality, you don't have to have kind of this goes here and this goes here and this goes here. You can certainly let things work, um, work together, but do pay attention to recommended spacing. Um, I'm just gonna look a little bit more at some of the questions along the lines of, of spacing. You know, depending on your climate, there's there's certain things that are going to do better in different climates, right? And at different times of the year. So somebody mentioned cantaloupe. Um, melons, depending on the melon, melons can take a long time to go from seed or seedling to fruit. So the other thing that you want to pay attention to, depending on your climate, and again, seed packets or seed catalogs, is the number of days it tells you it will take kind of from start to finish. And, you know, if you have a melon or a squash that says, you know, 120 days, that might not work for your Northeast climate. You might choose something that's more like a smaller melon that's 90 days or something like that. It's still gonna be a little tough, but not impossible to grow things like melons and okra um, that somebody also mentioned in a Northeast climate, um, you know, cause it just needs more, it just needs more time. But, you know, it really, it, the climate is changing in terms of how long a growing season we actually have, not necessarily for good reasons due to climate change, but there's ways to kind of stress things, we'll, stretch things rather. We'll probably have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole nother workshop, maybe next year or another time on season extension where you know simple um, uh, greenhouse quality plastic can be used to make what's called low tunnels over hoops that you can make yourself. Um, or if you're really into it, you might into gardening or you're, or you're a farmer, you might end up with something called a hoop house, <clears throat> excuse me, which is again, a not a heated, not heated with fossil fuel thing, but just by having this extra layer of a, greenhouse quality plastic. And when I say greenhouse quality, it means um, UV resistant. So it won't turn into lots of shreds of itty bitty pieces of plastic all over the place to extend your season. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the crops here. Uh, another thing to keep in mind 
are what are considered cold hardy crops. That means they don't mind if there is a bit of frost. In fact, some actually like the cold better. So again, in the Northeast climate um, or North Atlantic even, um, or places where you have winter. Basically, there are things that are um, like root crops, carrots, radishes, beets that you can plant earlier in the spring. Um, some of the, uh, somebody mentioned daikon radishes, um, or you can plant at the kind of the end of the summer for fall harvest, because those things actually prefer cool weather. They don't like the heat. Um, other things will die if they're out on, um, you know, if there are other things that are that are heat loving will not survive if there's a frost or a cold season. So again, in in the I'm just going to say New Hampshire, because that's where this program is coming out of in New Hampshire, often a Memorial Day weekend is thought of the safe time when you can plant your things like tomatoes and eggplants and basil outside. Um, because it's it's past most likely past a frost date, but you can't plant them at this gets, I don't want to overcomplicate things, but the reason that people usually plant those things in the Northeast climate, not from seeds, but as starts or seedlings is because if you just put a tomato seed in the ground in New Hampshire on June 1st, it wouldn't have enough time to make a tomato by the time a frost came. So that's why you start with a small plant for heat loving crops, either that you've raised or, you know, gotten at a farmer's market or um, local garden center. Um, I'm also just seeing some of the, the and, and that goes for squash and cucumbers too. You, you need to, in this climate, give it the space. Somebody mentioned buttercup squash um, and, and make sure that, you know, um, anything that's a squash, a tomato, an eggplant, a pepper, basil, anything that likes heat is planted um, when it's warm enough. Wild edible plants. Yeah, that's great. I mean, one of my favorites is nettles. Somebody asked about wild edible plants, which do grow stinging nettles. Urtica dioica do grow in the wild. Um, you have to harvest them with care, but you can also grow things like nettles, which are wonderful in tea, wonderful for pestos, really nourishing, really nourishing foods. Um, somebody mentioned mint uh, and one thing I want to say about anything in the mint family, they're wonderful herbs, but they will spread like crazy. So you want to make sure they're in a well-contained pot or an area where you want them to spread because they are perennials and they will, um, they will take over. I've seen a few questions about garlic, which is dear to our hearts because we grow quite a bit of garlic at Seeds of Solidarity. And, um, and that is a really fabulous plant. You actually plant that um, in the fall. You plant one clove, keep the paper on, make sure you get the garlic from a farmer who's growing it out or someone who grows garlic, not a supermarket where they may have sprayed it to not sprout. And um, one clove uh, lives over winter and becomes a full bulb that you then harvest the following July. So it's about a nine month um, gestation, just like babies and uh, you want to plant it in a spot where you can, you know, you can leave it in basically till the middle of July in a Northeast climate. Um, I do see another question here, back to cardboard. Oh, I just want to say one thing about when you plant seeds, like most with root crops, a few people mentioned carrots and daikon and so forth. Um, usually something that you, um, is called a root crop, meaning you eat the root part of the plant, you usually plant those as seeds directly in the ground rather than starting them ahead because um, they don't like to be disturbed. So a rule of thumb when you are planting seeds like that directly in the ground is how deep you plant them. So this is another important rule of thumb thing. Some people get discouraged because they say, well, I, you know, I planted my carrot seed and I don't know why it didn't come up. And they maybe planted it three inches down in the soil, giving it lots and lots of depth. Well, the carrot seed is teeny tiny. So if you've planted it that deeply, it's not going to get light and it's not going to get moisture um, to sprout. So uh, a, a gen very general rule of thumb with seeds is twice to plant them, whether you're starting them ahead for seedlings or you're planting seeds directly in your garden at the appropriate time 
is twice as deep as the size of the seed. Very general rule of thumb. You plant it twice as deep as the size of the seed. Now I say very general because there's a lot of flowers, for example, that need light to germinate and, and you don't cover them at all. But um, it's better to cover seeds a little less rather than a little more. So general rule of thumb, twice as deep as the size of, size of the seed. I'm going to um, just respond to this question in the chat and then we'll see if there's any more questions. And then I'm gonna do a kind of cool demo that you might like to try at home. So, um, so you have a hole in your cardboard, you wanna plant your seedling, how deep to dig the hole and what do you add to the soil and how much to add? Um, so basically that again stems from the cardboard method you know, illustration for the Instagarden that I showed in the slideshow. Um, what you want to do, you're, this is this method is sort of assuming that your soil's not great. If your soil's fine, like if you're putting cardboard down in an existing garden, then you only need to plant or to dig a hole rather into that soil that is as um, you know um, not very big, really as big as kind of the the root mass and then some of the seedling that you're planting in, but still maybe add a little bit of rich uh, compost to that. If you're basically trying to create, do this Insta garden in a setting where, you know, the soil's pretty funky, like not very rich at all, has never been a garden before, I would say take a shovel and, and make it kind of like a nice shovel sized hole. Um, and like about the depth of your, you know, of your shovel and round like your shovel, move that soil out. Um, and then, or and then you can mix that soil depending on how good it is with about um, like a shovelful or two of nice rich compost, and then put that back in the hole. There's a phrase with um, tree planting that says um, make a fifty dollar hole for a five dollar tree, which don't worry, it's not going to cost you that much for your like tomato plant. But the idea is that you want to make you know the hole a little richer, so. So your plants have a good start. So that's that's a great question there. All right. Any other questions? We have some nice ideas in the chat about things people have upcycled. Again, um, you could try. Oh, for the reason you sometimes see, which I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of putting black plastic down and cutting through it because then you end up with all this waste black plastic. That's why we recommend the cardboard for mulch instead, but some of the reason people use black plastic in a northeast climate, especially on farms, is to heat up and heat up the soil and expedite it for things like melons and okra. But I would just put that okra in the sunniest spot you have and uh, start with a seedling that someone else has grown and, and hope for the best. Um, someone asked about forest gardens, which um, is not really my expertise, but um, but you know, some people are basically looking at how you can can raise things like like mushrooms, um, shiitake mushrooms on oak logs and other plants that you know um, that that don't mind some shade, and also kind of think in terms of like understory and overstory. So you're you're growing things that are lower to the ground as well as um, above them to kind of grow some crops that aren't aren't like your typical vegetables, but there's some other things that we might want to explore um, eating the leaves of. And um, and also, again, I think something like raising shiitake mushrooms are an amazing crop. So if you have a shaded area, you might want to look into um, getting some mushroom spores and injecting them into oak logs and following the instructions for raising your own shiitake in forested, in forested settings. All right, culinary herbs, um, again, are great, um, especially if you don't have a lot of space, you can grow a lot of wonderful um, um, fresh herbs in containers and sometimes on windowsills. So culinary herbs are just, are, are great for small settings or just, or just you know, in your, in your beds or in pots in and around other things. Um, asparagus <clears throat> take a few years, they're usually grown in, Kind of a trench and you um you get something that's called um, a crown and you you get that from a nursery and you plant those and you leave them there so again it's a perennial and they send up a shoot in may that you harvest and then like that's it um but they need to be in a place where they're going to be 
for a long time because they might take a couple or three years to actually produce asparagus, but then they can produce asparagus for 30 or 40 years. So cool. Great questions. Um, they might still keep coming in, but I'm gonna show you something fun here. Oops. So um, this is a colander, right? You can, uh, if you have some extras, you can use your own or you can get one at like a Salvation Army or tag sale or something. You can use a metal one or you can get a plastic one. It doesn't matter. Um, they have holes in them, so you don't need to make holes. In fact, you might wanna, uh, after, after I show you what I'm showing you, put like a plate or something underneath. This is a really fun windowsill thing. So I have filled this with some potting soil and I didn't talk so much about potting soil, but basically if you're starting your own seeds, and I'm sure there are people on this um, presentation that do or might want to, something, there's a, there's a lot to say about starting seeds, but what you wanna keep in mind is that it's not a super heavy soil mix right? That it's pretty light. And that and, and this is a good um, uh, uh, buying like a seed starting, an organic seed starting mix. If you're starting your own seeds or you want to do a colander thing like this is a good thing because it's lighter. It's got a nice mix of compost, either um, coir, which is a coconut husk fiber, or peat moss, which I don't super rep recommend because of the overmining of the peat bogs. But so we want to be, you know, thoughtful about how much of that we use. But it also often has some little white things in it, which is we're known as perlite, which is actually exploded volcanic ash um, that adds lightness to the soil, and it just helps the seeds get a better start. So I'm going to put this down for a moment on my desk, and then I'm going to open up a packet of a mix of um, a lettuce blend of seeds. And this is from another. I don't work for any seed company. But this is from High Mowing, which is actually a New Hampshire based seed company. And again, back to the initial suggestion that you don't use GMO seeds and that you use, you seek out seeds from small seed companies to support all the wonderful seed companies that are there, uh, especially ones that are trying to carry forth open pollinated or heirloom seeds, which can be saved depending on the plant and, um, and, and their, the seed company encouragement for people to do that. So I'm gonna um, put some of the seeds from the seed packet in my hand and I'm right-handed, so I'm, I'm pouring them into my left hand because then I'm going to, if I can do this, take my colander and I'm gonna um, sprinkle, like I'm sprinkling salt on top of my soil in the colander, which has been lightly moistened and again, think in terms of heavily salting your food. Sorry for anyone with high blood pressure out there, but it's seeds, not salt. So think in terms of um, heavily salting your food to do this colander garden. And there was a picture of it in the slideshow. And again, just because I opened the packet doesn't mean I have to use all the seeds, right? That goes for everything. So I've, I've sprinkled it on top, kind of heavily salting my food like that. And then I'm gonna take some soil I had to the side here and I'm gonna just sprinkle that on top. And I like to use my hand. So even though it's gonna get all over my keyboard here, I'm going to cover um, the seeds, keeping in mind that twice as deep as the size of the seed thing, right? So I'm only covering them lightly because this blend of lettuce seeds that I put on here they're pretty small. And so what I'm doing here is I'm making kind of like a windowsill colander salad garden. So I'm covering them lightly. And then I'm gonna mark what it is. And this is also um, another kind of upcycling idea. So if you eat yogurt, you might have, if you don't make your own yogurt um, all the time, I don't make mine all the time, um, you might, you know, have some yogurt containers and I cut some strips from the yogurt container to make a seed a seedling tag, okay? You can also use like old Venetian blinds or pieces of wood or cedar or whatever, but that's kind of a fun way to, to um, repurpose yogurt containers uh, to make your own seed tag. So that says the date and it says lettuce mix. And then I'm gonna put it in there 
right? And then I'm gonna stick this um, on my kitchen windowsill. And I'm gonna, with a sprayer or uh, you know, a, a, a watering can that has a nice misty thing, just keep it a little moist. And it's gonna grow like a little lettuce garden. And when the, when the lettuce, lettuces are about that high, I'm gonna take my scissors and cut them and enjoy a nice salad. And then I'm gonna water it again and it's gonna make another salad. And I might be able to do that like three times. In fact, it, outside in the garden, in our, at our farm, we, can, we sometimes get like five to 10 to 12 cuttings off of our salad greens and arugula and spinach, right? So you can do this. I use the lettuce mix. You could do it with arugula. You could do it with, um, with spinach. Um, but it's just a fun way, especially now in the winter, to kind of do a nice little windowsill garden. I was teaching a, a virtual gardening course for healthcare workers from a local hospital um, that the hospital had offered them as, as, as sort of a gift because of all the intensity over the last few years. Um, and one woman afterwards told me that she made a whole bunch of these and gave them out as Mother's Day gifts when she, so I thought that was really fun. You know, she started them in kind of um, the end of April or something and gave them to people so they could watch their own seeds come up or let us come up. So this is, this is to make a salad garden that you actually eat. That said, it's not a terrible way to start seedlings either. Um, so for example, if I wanted to start some basil seedlings early and I didn't have a good place to do that, I would sprinkle it not as heavily, but I could also use this as kind of a little seed starting bowl. And then once those basil seedlings got big enough, I could gently scoop my hand in and transplant them into you know, um, small little cups that had some drainage at the bottom and let them keep growing until it was warm enough to put them outside. So this is the sal colander salad garden, but um, starting you know, seeds this way, if you're only doing a few, could work. We actually, I don't have one um, here with me in my office, but on our farm, we actually start all of our seeds in these wooden flats that we've made that are about three inches deep and you know, like uh, uh, two foot by a foot or so. And we just make, right now we've got them going. So we'll make like little rows for the broccoli and the cauliflower and the kale and the things that are all cool, hardy plants and, um, and then transplant them out of that tray uh, into other containers. But you can really start quite a lot in a small space. <clears throat> so, um, Let's see, are there any more questions? Oh yes, I see some, I see some more, okay. Um, can coconut planter liners be used in a colander so it's not leaky? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the colander won't leak that much, but yeah, you could definitely, those coconut planter liners that you can get for like hanging baskets, those coir liners can absolutely um, be used, be used that way. And somebody put into the chat, I don't, I think it's a um, suggestion or a story from Nora. That's a great one about where Nora found some, um, some great large raised beds that she could repurpose and, um, and use to grow things in. So that's a great suggestion. Keep your, keep your, eyes, keep your eyes open um, to different resources in your, in your community that can be repurposed. That's great. Uh, any other questions? We're, we, we did well for time and we're just at the end, but please don't hesitate to take another minute or two to ask a question either in the chat or by raising your hand. While we allow folks a couple more minutes to think about whether they have questions, I'm going to put two links in the chat for folks to have access to. So the first one um, I can put in right now, and that is the link to Seeds of Solidarity's website. So the organization that Deb helped found. Um, and so you can click on that link directly in the chat to find out more information about who they are and what they're doing. Um, and the other one is going to be um, the website on Cheshire County Conservation District's website 
for our county here in New Hampshire. And this will be the page for Menad Not Grows Together. But there's so many resources that are right there on their site. And there's links to all of the events that they have going on, whether it's um, um, workshops about, you know, different tools that they have or the workshops that I've been helped put on with Menad Not Grows Together. So um, I'll throw that in there right now. And that is another website that you can get some more information on. That's terrific, Nico. Thank you for putting those resources in. And, um, and I guess as we close, I want to say thanks again to Mananak Grows Together and the Cheshire County Conservation District for, for um, having me tonight. And I do encourage folks to check out our website. There's lots of resources there too, um, and, and workshops and so forth on our seedsofsolidarity.org. Um, website and if anybody feels like it you can throw into the chat like you know a word or a phrase that that um that you take from this evening be it an idea or an inspiration you certainly don't have to do that but it would be fun it would be fun to see if anybody wants to to um toss in a word or phrase of an inspiration or something or an idea that you take from the workshop and and um as we close so I think people are asking about the um, whether it was recorded, and I'm assuming that people who signed up will get the re will get the recording link. Great, Benet says yes. All right, I love seeing these healing. Just do it. Keep it simple. Just do it. Start collecting cardboard. Great, but it was helpful. I'm so glad. Like the upcycling ideas, and thanks for sharing those. All right, wonderful. Great, well, as people are signing off, just, you know, I'll just say again, enjoy it. Really, just enjoy the process. If anybody tells you they have all the answers, they're wrong. So <laughs> we're all learning something every day and just connect in with, your garden with nature, with each other and enjoy the process. <laughs>